You think after yours. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Kim, for that introduction, and thanks everyone for showing up. Uh, so a warm uh, afternoon, so this is a nice uh, hour to sit down in. I'll, I'll be, uh, hopefully I won't put anyone to sleep today, but as Kim mentioned, um, I was a Kerry Johnson fellowship uh, recipient, and um, you could research any part of the collection here at the archives. And um, so I took on the Robert Emmett Literary Association, which I'm going to attempt to explain here today. And uh, they're a very interesting group to me. They're a very, it's a very un, uh, underreported story and their contribution to Butte history, as well as how they paralleled with the Irish independence movement from about 1880 to about 1925. And so it's very um, great that I get to be here during Honorary Law Week. It's great to see the Irish flags all over the streets. And for those of you who um, are going to Honorary Law, just put a personal plug in. Um, it's an awesome lineup. If you, are interested in um, Irish music, traditional music. Um, there's some real stars that are coming to view. Seamus Egan, Mick McCauley, Kathy Ryan, um, just uh, uh, John Williams on accordion, just a whole host of musicians. So I hope that you can make it up and take that all in. And Roy Maycomb, and just uh, unbelievable. Um, so I hope you can do this, and uh, it's very um, uh, it's an honor to be here during Andre Raleigh. So as I mentioned, um, I was a recipient. I finished up my work last summer, and um, I brought in some of the materials that I worked with. Um, this is a small portion of the minute books, which I've read through many times to get information. I think I can even sit down uh, this afternoon and probably pick out things that I had missed. <laughs> That's how intense it is. And um, for all you people who are on boards or organizations, um, minute takers are very essential. Some of the minutes are really hard to read, and some of them are excellent for penmanship. I'm sure they're a product of Catholic school, which I am myself. <laughs> so anyway, there's, there's that. Um, so anyway, I have, there's some of you in here that know me, some of you who don't. I'm just going to take a quick second to introduce myself so that you know who's speaking. As I mentioned, John Conlon. Um, these are two things I like doing, going to Ireland on the left and hiking the mountains. So that's how I got out here is Montana. I'll show you where I grew up in a second. That's me up in Northern Ireland. I have dual citizenship with Ireland. I've had that for a number of years. I have cousins in County Clare uh, and all over the place, but my, uh, and I'll show you that in a second as well, but that's kind of my connection and I felt that um, I just wanted to point that out. Um, and that's uh, where I grew up. It's out in the Midwest, it's Peoria, Illinois. It's between Chicago and St. Louis. Um, I had relatives that lived in Chicago and Chicago has a huge Irish American community, a vibrant music scene. Uh, and St. Louis goes as well. In fact, I'm just about ready to sit down with a book that I found about the Irish in St. Louis. So they're everywhere, but um, that's not the focus today. But um, anyway, when I was 18, I spent my last year of high school staring out the window, uh, trying to figure out how and where I was going. And so I came here. And that's the University of Montana, Missoula. That's um, uh, main hall on campus for St. Patrick's Day lit up. Kind of cool. It's not like Butte, but uh, <laughs> it's not like Butte, but <laughs> it's an attempt, and that's just a shot from um, uh, not so. So anyway, um, there's a little bit of connection. Uh, my Irish connection, just real quickly, up at the top, uh, that's my uh, grandmother Hogan's cottage in Anastasia County Clare. Below that, um, and actually across the road, um, are the Conlins, and that's through my grandparents. They lived across the road from one another. Um, over in the far right, there they are after they had come to America in Peoria, Illinois, in front of um, St. Mary's Church. And my grandfather was always impeccably dressed, always a tie and a jacket, uh, grandmother as well, even if it wasn't Sunday. That little house down there in the right-hand corner, you can imagine moving from that to that. That's the south side of Peoria. He was a railroad worker. Uh, my grandmother raised five kids, including my father. Uh, the connection with the two families goes great. There's, um, <clears throat> they would, um, that was a whole, um, it was a women's household up there, no males except for the father. Um, they would um, telegraph down to the Conlins when they needed help with Hain. They'd put sheets on the hedge, and that was a message for the men to come up and help with Hain and things like that. So there's a ton of Irish stories that um, are just part of our, our um, Conlin storybook, I guess. I spent many, uh, um, many a time over there on the right hand side, taking the bus down from our house to, um, to visit them on the south side of Peoria. And um, just one quick story, my grandfather in the right hand corner was a teller of stories. He loved stories about fairies 
and um, he would always try to get me to go to bed early, and since he knew I liked baseball, he always tried to get me to go to bed and say that the um, uh, fairies would be uh, setting up the bases out on the side yard, and that if I went to bed early, I got up in the morning, I'd be able to catch him playing baseball out there. <laughs> so that, that, worked, that worked for a while, but, um, <laughs> but anyway, so that's kind of an introduction of, of um, you know, of my connection with that. But the main topic for today is uh, Robert Emmett Literary Association. And I thought what I might do today, this morning, just for a few minutes, is kind of frame a case as to why an organization would be named after Robert Emmett. And if you're familiar with Irish history, um, you probably all know about the Dublin Easter Rising in 1916. There were quite a few risings prior to that. And in fact, there was quite a few that failed. But with each failed rising, or um, against the British uh, government and empire, lessons were learned. And so four years before um, Emmett tried to have a rebellion in the early 1800s in, um, in uh, Dublin, the Vinegar Hill in 1798, there were a lot of lessons learned. So he had a plan where he was going to um, ask the French to intervene on, the, on behalf of the Irish. The French never showed up. Um, but it was a well-taken plan. I'm not a military person, but I've read quite a bit about this. There were arms caches throughout Dublin. Um, they had men stationed that they would be able to call to arms on a moment's notice. So it was pretty planned out. Unfortunately, he was caught and um, sentenced to die. And you're probably maybe familiar with this or not, but I put this up here. This is his um, quote. Uh, it's called Speech from the Docks. And uh, you, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward, but uh, you can read that if you like. Um, but um, he definitely had a sense of history, and he was going to make sure that his name was um, remember it throughout history. Now the reason I put this up here is you have to remember this is early 1800s. So the Irish start coming in to view later on in the 1800s, but the grandparents at this time, parents and the kids all knew about Robert Emmett. He was a hero at that time. So those, that story about Emmett all came down to immigrants as they came to the United States. So by the time I started researching this in 1880, Robert Emmett and of course he's the namesake for the, for, the, for the organization, was well known. Not only was he well known just in oral history, but there were several things that were in the United States that honored him. Number one, uh, here on the left, uh, there were several statues. This statue is in front of the Irish Embassy in Washington, D.C. Originally it appeared in the Chicago World's Fair in 1903, and then it was transferred um, for someone who actually lived in D.C. for a couple of years, I forget the name of the circle, but you know, all those traffic circles in D.C. It's Embassy Row. I, I'm not quite to sure. Is it No, it's not DuPont. No, it's du DuPont. It's the other one. It's the other one. The other one. <laughs> it's du yeah, don't ever call it DuPont Circle. You never get out of that in the rain. Um, and then over here in the center, um, this was um, dedicated by Amy Deborah Lair when he came to California. And now that had been since moved to an uh, uh, institution of higher learning in California. And then over on the far right is in um, St. Stephen's Square, Square, excuse me, in, um, in Ireland. So there was this, not only was it an oral history, but when you're starting to see a, a, a whole buildup in terms of arts that were devoted to his memory. And so that will have an impact here in a second. Not only that, um, but um, the statue here in, in front of the Capitol, Thomas Francis Marr, at the dedication, uh, Emmett's name was given as uh, inspiration, he was referred to as a martyr. And so this whole thing kept on building and building and building in terms of his, um, I, I really call it almost, it's almost like a cult, uh, but in a good way. Um, but anyway, there's mention of him at the uh, statue at, at uh, in Helena, and Representative King probably knows all about that one, so <laughs> I'm sure you've seen that before. Um, but also, too, um, you started to see a lot of, um, information in the newspapers of the time about Robert Emmett. So there was the print media, which was getting Emmett to be um, quite uh, remembered. So this, uh, Patrick Ford, very interesting, he grew up in um, County Galway, came to the United States, fought in the Civil War, was an abolitionist, and started one of the most influential Irish newspapers that was probably the most widely read newspaper um, in America at that time. It was just full of information about immigrants, especially Irish immigrants, labor history. And so Patrick Ford devoted pages upon pages, if you go back and pull out things, of information about um, 
uh, Robert Emmett, what he did, who he was. And so this was all going out to people who were in view. This newspaper was read in view. There were several papers that were read in view. This one in particular, but Patrick Ford, um, he's like Thomas Francis Marr. You know, Marr grew up in uh, Waterford, um, was transported to Tanzania, uh, escaped, became a lawyer, Civil War general. All of these people had an incredible history and in just how they survived and, and went through all those things to make it. But the, the, the case was being built for the memory of Emmett. And then one last one, um, <clears throat> John Boyle O'Reilly came to Butte um, in the late 1800s. He had a newspaper, it was entitled The Pilot. He devoted incredible amounts of, uh, 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 he would reproduce the speeches of Emmett and put these in the newspaper. So this is the 1880s, which is right about the time where I start here with the Emmett Association here in a minute. He's another interesting one. Um, real quickly, he was, and you know, the Irish were in the British Army back in those days. A lot of them didn't have a choice. It was a job. And his, he was a British, um, kind of an officer. He was recruiting Finians within the British Army to revolt against the British. And eventually he got caught. He got sent to Tasmania. He escaped, went to Boston, started this paper. And um, before he became the editor, the pilot was known for being kind of a racist newspaper. Some of the accounts are pretty bad. He changed that around. He became friends with uh, Frederick Douglass and a lot of the abolitionists at the time. Um, Garrison, Wendell Phillips, a whole bunch of them. And so he came to Butte as well. But I just wanted to show you that it was in the arts, but it was also in the print media as well, that there was this feeling about Emmett. <clears throat> And then that led me to the Emmett. So I hope that kind of builds a little bit of a case as to why Emmett would be the name of this organization. There, it could have, I mean, why wasn't it, you know, Charles Parnell Stewart? Why wasn't it Alan De Valera Literary Association? He, of, of all the people in the 1800s, this, he was the person. So a couple little things here. Get into this and kind of get in the nuts and bolts. I just want to make it known that this was not a group that just met weekly, which they did, and it was a free-for-all. It was very structured. They, if you, I don't know how many of you have been on boards or organizations, but there's a thing called Robert's Rules of Order. Okay, so you have a roll call, you have a uh, committee reports. Um, they did all of that. They were organized, they were very structured. So what they did was, um, the organization in Butte was formed in 1881, so I just kind of put this up so you can read along. There were 42 Irish Americans in Butte who formed the core of that group. Um, they were also known as the, um, I put RELA, that's Robert Emmett Literary Association, Camp 90 of the Clonagale. There were different Clonagale groups throughout the country. Clonagale is a pretty radical group. In fact, they, I won't say all of them, but they were definitely in the physical force camp, and they came together you either felt that you were going to get independence through the constitutional way, and I'll get into that in a second, or you're just going to go to armed rebellion against the Brits. <clears throat> so they're a little bit more in that case. Um, the National USA Clan uh, was formed in 1865. So you can see the Butte one was not too far behind the National one. The National one was in New York. The Butte group reported to the San Francisco area. Okay? Um, so I put a couple of their goals here. And I do have their articles in the corporation just to show you that they were not a fly-by-night organization. They, were, they had to go through the state of Montana just like you would do if you were registering a business or a foundation. And, um, but the, basically what they wanted to do was preserve the independence of the USA. They wanted to provide knowledge of Irish history. They wanted to promote trade relations between Ireland and the US. They wanted to promote a revival of language, music, and customs of Ireland. And if you're familiar with the Gaelic League, that was really what they were all about, was that the only way, before you could get independence from England, you needed to know the Irish language, you need to know about Irish um, traditional music, um, and all those things that, um, that distinguished Ireland from Britain. That was a big deal. We didn't want to be like Britain. So it was a good point. Um, they wanted immediate independence. So I'll get into all this in a second. And as I mentioned, there was this continual thing at the very bottom. How would you get independence? Would it be an armed rebellion? Or would it be through the constitutional process? And at the time I'm researching this, home rule was going on in Ireland. And if you know your Irish history, home rule failed three times. The British kept on promising it. And home rule was limited independence for Ireland. It was a gradual constitutional 
process. So this is a tension that goes on throughout all of Irish American history. How do we get there? And even in Ireland as well. Um, but um, uh, Charles uh, Parnell Stewart would be one of the ones that would probably be most um, known about for home rule. So um, that's kind of the, the context. So you can always read the print, but there's always things that happen in between the lines, which is what I'm hoping I can show you here today. Okay. Um, so to keep this all in mind, here's what's going on in Ireland at the time. And, okay, and then what I'd like to show is how the Emmets <laughs> intersected with this. So in the 1880s, there was the Irish Land League and tenants' rights. So Irish were getting displaced from their land, evicted. Um, it was a mess. And so the tenants uh, with Michael Davitt were very instrumental in trying to, to rectify that. And this is a, I, I apologize for this, this is a really quick skim over of Irish history and I get in trouble with any professor over here when we do this, but I'm just throwing it out there. Um, the Irish Gaelic League was starting to come into practice with um, uh, Douglas Hyde. You have to be, you have to know your Irish language, you have to know your, your cousin, you know, your culture has been wiped out by the British, we need to get this back going again. So this is going on at the same time. If you're familiar with Abbey Theatre and W.B. Yeats, uh, Lady Gregory, all the arts were really starting to flourish. It's really a cool time to be in Ireland, 1900s. As I mentioned, Irish Home Rule was going on at the same time, okay? Um, and then you have the Dublin Easter Rising in 1916. Home Rule had failed three times, so there's a lot of frustration built up, which shows up in these minutes. Then, after the Easter Rising, you have the Irish War of Independence, okay? And then that terminates and the Irish Free State Treaty starts. Again, it's limited autonomy for Ireland. It's not total I Irish independence. And most of the people I'll show you here in a second, which I've talked about previously in a previous brown bag, um, they came to speak against that, and the Emmets were against that. Then you had the Irish Civil War. And then you had World War I. So you got a lot of stuff going on at the same time while this is still being, uh, while the Emmets were um, debating all these things and trying to figure out where they fit in. Okay, <clears throat> before I get into this, I just want to mention that World War I, since I finished with that one, it wasn't overwhelming, so there was not overwhelming support uh, for the American cause in World War I with this group. Um, it's generally felt that any kind of damage to the British Empire would, would benefit um, Ireland. So they supported um, uh, Germany to a certain extent, but then after World War I started picking up, they kind of backed off from that a little bit. But there's several quotes in the minutes here about how they would hope that there'd be a lot of British ships sunk at the bottom of the ocean because mm -hmm. of the Germans. Um, so that was very controversial in the minutes, which I'll get to in a second. And then over in South Africa, <clears throat> excuse me, in the 1900s there was the Boer War. They were, that was another attempt for Irish to um, support the Boers against the English, hoping that that would put a dent in the um, British Empire, and then that would be a, a weakening and allow the Irish independence movement to gain some steam. There actually were reports of a group from um, Anaconda and Butte who actually had an Irish brigade that fought in South Africa for the Boers. Mm. It's an interesting story, which I won't get into right now, but um, it's, it, they were treated like heroes when they came back to Butte. It's, it's pretty, pretty interesting to me. So anyway, I just mentioned that for a second. Um, okay, so let's talk about the Emmets. They were a semi-secretive organization. Now, in the books here, if you want to come up afterwards, um, and I have some other documentation here as well, as I mentioned, it wasn't a, a willy-nilly fly-by-night organization. It was very structured. You know, there was a membership card. All the books have a role of um, uh, who, who was inducted, who wasn't, the dues, who owed money. Um, and so um, my theory, is that there was a secret society because at that same time in Ireland there were secret societies that were, invent that were involved in tenants' rights. Um, there were the Ribbon Men and the White Boys, and they were Irish groups that basically were fighting the landlords. So they used to do things, some, some of it was just you know, nuisance, nuisance kind of stuff, um, tearing down the landlord's fences or the ditches or the cows, but it got violent. And there were the people who were killed and the Ribbon Boys and the White Boys were semi-secret organization. And the Emmets in the books here always say that there was nothing ever, <coughs> excuse me, ever done in Ireland 
that wasn't done uh, by a secret society. So I think the connection there at the same time uh, might have something to do with um, uh, why they were secretive, but in a way, they weren't because you can look at these books and find out who everyone was. But as Kim <laughs> mentioned, um, as Kim mentioned, you can find a person and their number and such as you go along here. This is all here in the books. So <clears throat> that's how you got in. Now here's an example of a potential, and you can read in the books here, of a member introduction. So you want to be an Emmet. Um, you had to be vouched by, if you read the top one there, Cormac McCarvey, occupation minor, resident of Butte, born in Ireland, proposed by Brother 26. You had to have somebody nominate you. Then you were vouched for by, three, uh, by another person, and then you went to a committee, and then you had Brothers 23, 47, and 18 decide whether or not you were accepted. So it was kind of, um, <clears throat> I don't, you know, I'm sure it probably lent itself to some corruption, but I, I couldn't really tell you if it did because you know, maybe your brother was in there, I'm not sure. <laughs> but, um, but my favorite one here is with um, this next one, Occupation Minor, 29, the height, the color of the eyes, believes in a supreme being. So this was a very religious... Oh, a human. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a very, very religious um, group. Now Dave Emmons, who in my opinion is one of the best in knowing about Irish history in Montana, he estimates that between that time period, which is about where I was looking at, there were about 800 members, and alone in 1905, there were 600. So it was a big group when you think about it. I know the Butte population was big at that time. And then in 1923 to 21, there were 977 enrolled members. Now, not everyone was a great member. <clears throat> some people didn't pay their dues. Some people had to get reprimanded for that. But it was, um, you know, um, that's how you got into the organization. And I have some documents up, up there as well to show that. <clears throat> Now, it wasn't just for Butte people. Anyone who was in the United States who was a member of the Clan of Gale could be a, an honorary member in Butte. This is a really famous story, and I ran across this by ch just by half, by half a chance. The Crodwell prisoners, it's, um, Patrick Finnegan was accused of murdering a man during those land wars that I mentioned to you, and um, he served multiple prison terms and um, came to the United States and came to Butte. And he was writing a book and he was interested in support for his book. Um, but this is a huge famous case. I contacted a fellow through the Irish government and, and he couldn't say enough about how important this case is in Irish history and I just happened on it. And it's really because a, minute, a notation in the minutes said that Patrick Finnegan um, came to Butte. Um, but anyway, he was falsely accused for a murder of um, Peter Doherty. Um, eight people were killed, he had 20 years in prison. All of these prison terms are just incredible. He came to Butte and he spoke of his imprisonment. So it's an example of the Emmets being open to everyone. And they were open not only just to themselves, to other Clan Nigel people, but to the Ancient Order of Hibernians. Um, every Irish group that was in the Phil Sheridan Club from Anaconda, all of them were welcome and they all worked together well. But I just wanted to bring that up. It wasn't just a little group where you couldn't get in unless you were from Butte. It was very inclusive that way. So but I thought that was it was very cool that way. Didn't um, you have to be in the AOH first in order to be, like you had to be, that was part of your proof to be in the R AOH in order to join the RELA? Um, I'm not familiar with that, Kim, okay. to be honest with you. There was some, there was some crossover, <laughs> but okay. I, I never ran across that as a requirement. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to bring that up, but this is an incredibly, uh, in the minutes, um, they mentioned that he served at Kilmainham Jail, if you're familiar with Kilmainham Jail in Dublin. De Valera served time there, all of them did. The minutes said he served time in uh, Kilmainham, but actually I researched that he didn't, but he probably said that when he came here, but he was at Mount Joy, which is right up the road, basically. So we'll, we'll give him some slack on that, but, and it might have just been the minute taker. Um, but it wasn't just for your common minor. These are some pretty famous people in Butte. So Hennessy, business owner, you know, Father Hannon, he was master of um, um, St. Mary's Church, and Judge Lynch. So it wasn't just, um, you know, the, um, the common person, so to speak. But um, Father Hannon, I've done some work on Father Hannon, and he was a, a very interesting character. 
um, he has some uh, wonderful quotes when you think about, when I think of the priest that I had in school, I don't think I ever had one like him. Uh, and I mean that in a good way, because I would have been interested in it. But um, he said that the, um, uh, Father Hannon said that um, the Irish, and while he was in Butte, said the Irish Republic <coughs> Army was fighting for the country. The others are poor, misguided fools fighting England's battles. Um, but he was originally from Limerick, and he was um, outspoken um, against the um, British Empire. And he would hope that, um, as I mentioned, the Irish Free State Treaty, he was hoping that that would be at the end of the rope for the English, and he was hoping that changes would come. But um, he was also realistic. He knew that the Brits had more firepower than some of the IRA units. And um, one other quote from him, he, he referred to the, some of the Irish who were willing to cooperate with the um, British as um, to lie down under the heels of England, are they worth fighting for? So he had a degree of frustration, I think, with people who were not more um, radical in their approach. And if you're familiar with um, Eamon de Valera, you also know there's a healthy competition between de Valera and Michael Collins. Father Hannon called Michael Collins a traitor. So I don't want to, um, I know he was from Cork, and I know there's Cork people in here, so I'm just saying, I'm just saying that's what he said. And he, he didn't hold it back. Um, but he was uh, very welcoming to a lot of people who, who um, came to, um, to Butte, but in you know, the, the business background of Hennessy, and Judge Lynch did introductory remarks for a lot of the speakers who came um, to Butte. So, um, as I mentioned, this was a structured group, and they had committees for guest lectures. I'm going to show that in a second. They had celebrations. These were all things they did for Butte. They had a, a New Year's Eve ball. Uh, one year, um, someone tried to dynamite the hall that they were in. They escaped from that. Um, they had a sick and relief fund for their members. Um, and um, the three that I want to focus on here have to do with, um, well, the first two, have to do with Irish independence and then also the Mahler statue um, in Helena. But um, going back up to the, to the um, sick and relief, every person who died, and I have these condolence letters here, every person who died in that organization got a handwritten condolence letter. And it wasn't a form that every person was, you know, just stamped it. They, they noted their, um, their qualities and what they did for Butte in the organization. And um, I didn't bring a box of letters, but I have a couple in here if you want to look at those later on today, this morning. So anyway, um, this is really important because this money went back to Ireland, and this money went back to Ireland, and this one went to Helena. I think that's pretty cool. Um, and I know a lot of people have stories about IRA and Butte and um, um, money going back and forth between here and arms and all that. I didn't really focus on that. So I know if you have some stories like that, I'd be more than willing to hear them because I know they're out there and I've heard a lot of them. But I just kind of stuck with what I could. And they were so secretive and to themselves, there's really no mention of that, although I'll talk about the military that they had here in a minute. Um, okay, so this is kind of a roll call here of all the important people who came to Ireland um, that I've been researching. I have a music program, um, I'm gonna do a little self-promotion here, on KBMF. It's right across the street from the courthouse. And I do an Irish music program, but I also do a history thing called the uh, Park Without the Crown. So I've been researching all these people, and I have a whole list of them. But these three women were definitely brought by the Robert Emmett Literary, Literary Association. And every one of them was against the Irish Free State Treaty, and all of them wanted independence immediately from Ireland. So um, you can kind of see what their bent was. They weren't willing to just sit around and say, well, we'll eventually get the independence. Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, her husband was killed by the British right after um, the Easter Rising. She came to Butte to talk about that. Uh, Linda Kearns, um, outstanding story with her. Um, she was a nurse during the takeover of the GPO in, our, in Dublin. Um, she um, became radicalized pretty much. Um, ran guns and things uh, with a nurse's uniform, I've mentioned her before, uh, was eventually caught by the British, served time, escaped, came to Butte and talked about her experiences. Emmett sponsored all these trips. Um, Constance Markiewicz, I put that up there with the military, that really wasn't her style, but she was a high-ranking uh, woman in the um, Irish Volunteers, and so she came to Butte as well, and um, you know she's kind of a star in her own right. But anyway, I, I've talked about them before. Um, but just a few more: Douglas Hyde um, with the Gaelic League. This man was a scholar. He um, 
put together the Irish Constitution before the Republic. Um, he came to view. All these people came to view. It's amazing. I walked these streets around here and I think, you know, here's one of them. Eamon de Valera walked up from Hepburn Field. Eamon, of course, he's in his own right, probably the most influential Irish politician in the 1900s. Michael Davitt was with the Land League. He came to view, all sponsored either by the Emmets or the AOH, basically. So there was cooperation. Um, Hundred Pier, well, starting over there on the far right, um, over, is this white, I guess? Um, Margaret Pierce, um, Padre Pierce is, um, was the signer of the Declaration and Proclamation. Um, that was her son. Um, Kathleen O'Brennan um, came. Uh, Kathleen uh, Barry, uh, Kevin Barry was her um, brother, was the youngest hung by the British Army. They all came to Butte. Um, so, I mean, it was, it was just kind of a, a great a collection of people that that came, uh, Mary McSweeney, Terence McSweeney was um, her um, son who was, her brother, excuse me, who was um, uh, executed, well actually he was on a hunger strike, he was the mayor of Cork. So the connections here are Emmett's again supporting all of these people to come to Butte. A couple more, I mentioned um, uh, Boyle O'Reilly. This is interesting to me. Um, James Larkin, who was a huge labor activist, he was an IWW, he was a wobbly, spent time at Sing Sing. Um, Emmett's do not mention him at all in their books. So he was more labor history. So maybe that was the cause, but they maybe were not interested in labor. James Conley came uh, 10 years before the Easter Rising. You know, he was executed for his role in the Easter Rising. He came to Butte, but he came to explain the benefits of socialism. He didn't really talk too much about Irish independence, but there's no mention in the books of these two. And to me, that's an interesting omission. I'm not quite sure why, um, um, but anyway, no mention of that. Uh, but they came to view as well. And um, that leads me to a couple little sections within each one of their meetings. Um, they had a military branch. It was about halfway through here, I would say about 1900. Um, it was decided that they want to have a military unit. So then I thought, oh, now I'm on to find out about these guns going to Ireland and this and that. <laughs> Um, so anyway, what they would do is, um, the military company was formed for the purpose of taking part in any revolution that might take place against British rule in Ireland. And drills became part of the meeting. So in the me middle of the meeting, if any of you have ever been on boards or anything like that, you know, 45 minutes into the meeting, you went out and drilled shotguns or, you know, marched or whatever for like 45 minutes. And then you come back in and finish your business, you know. Um, but um, it was pretty interesting because um, not only were they um, hoping that they'd be able to... Um, um, to take part in maybe some type of an armed revolution. I never found out, but there is a pledge right here. I'll just re quickly read it. Solemnly pledge my secret word and honor that I will obey and comply with the provisions of the military code and all lawful orders of my superior officers. officers. So there's that. Um, they're pretty serious about it. They also um, had a, a muster, an, uh, muster rule for a military so they could sign up. And they were hoping they'd have two companies with this. And then, on top of that, this is how official these, I keep on going back to this, there's an insurance form for their uniforms and their band that they have. They have their own military band that would march on all these parades. So those previous people that I mentioned, like Devil Air and all them, there were always um, the ACM band, and then there was the Emmett band, and whatever other band was in Buda at the time, all marching up the streets going around. I mean, it had to be quite the scene. I just wish it could have been filmed. Um, but I put this up here because um, I was interested in the Emmett Guards. I have yet to find a picture of them, but uh, um, Jim, or Tom Foley, excuse me, kind of a, an acquaintance, I guess, um, one of his relatives um, was in the Emmett Guards of um, Massachusetts. And um, so these guards were associated with the Clan of Gale and the Emmets throughout the whole country. So it wasn't just something that Butte did, but they definitely tapped into to one, uh, one another and. Um, for support, but um, I, I just um, I never saw anything about them um, going on to fight. But I do think some of the members eventually evolved into the Montana National Guard because there is a, a mention of that in a National Guard book, uh, which I read, and it mentions the Emmets. But they have, have competitions, shooting competitions, um, you know, Columbia Gardens, and the whole thing is pretty interesting. Um, so this is what I hope I can do. There was an agenda item for the good of the order, and this to me really touched on how Irish they were. 
Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Kaylees, but Kaylees in Ireland are Irish dance and music. And most of the Kaylees were, um, in the early days of Ireland, were in pubs and kitchens, villages, and a lot of the money that was raised went for people who might be kind of down on their luck at the time. So now when you see Kaylees around, it's a little, the music's still the same, but it has kind of a different connotation. So I'm, I'm not real, I'm just gonna play a couple snippets here. Um, the middle one, I might not play, but um, I did find a better one, but that's a country western version. But these are some songs that they might have sung um, that were mentioned in the minutes. And so I found one that Derek Warfield, and since we're doing Honorary Raw, he performed in Honorary Raw a number of years ago. <laughs> He's with the Wolf Tones. So I'm hoping that this will work out for you. I'll just do a snippet. So this is the girl I left behind. some music and um, kind of go to town and do these. Now this is a country western version. So it's um so that one was the girl that I left behind me. So all these had to do with immigration or agriculture. Because you know that's what was going on in Ireland at the time. So um, for all you country western fans out here, um, this is um, when the harvest days are over, uh, uh, Jesse Deer. So oh, this is the menstrual boy, sorry. Maybe not. that they did, um, so they debated whether there should be physical force um, or follow legislation for freedom. They debated the Irish land bill, and every person took an opinion, and that was debated. From what I understand, it was, it was pretty civil. Um, like, who was Ireland, Ireland's greatest benefactor? Was it Daniel O'Connell or Charles Stuart Parnell? Um, should U.S. senators be elected or appointed? You know, back then they were appointed, now they're elected. So they were debating all these things. 
Um, who is Ireland's greatest friend? Harry Grattan or Robert Emmett? Well, that'd be kind of a no-brainer because Robert Emmett was the name of the group. And then this was interesting to me, should immigration be restricted? And they wanted to know whether or not um, that would be restricted. And then um, a couple things, I can't get that one back up. One I, I wanted to just talk about was the humanitarian aid to Ireland. Um, the Emmets contributed over $18,000 to the Montana goal, which was $50,000. So there was quite a huge sum of money, and the humanitarian aid was for Ireland. That money went directly to Ireland. So all this money was being collected throughout the United States and sent in one big pot. Um, those Thomas, um, the Irish bond drive, which I have a certificate here. Um, this is for $500, just to start off, the Emmets sent to, um, uh, because it was requested by Eamon de Valera, um, they were, wanted to raise $80,000 in Montana. I mean, when you think about $80,000, that's certainly 1900 that money was flowing out of here. And then um, there's also, I have a document here for, um, they raised $4,000 for the pedestal and $10,000 for the statue of the Mahler statue at, um, at the Capitol. So they are actively involved, but I think the two that I wanted to focus mostly on was the um, humanitarian aid, and then the Irish bond drive was to support an Irish army. So there was kind of a direct connection there with giving money to Ireland and kind of let them do their thing. And um, there is a memorial for a statue, or a statue down in St. Patrick's Cemetery. Um, it was established in 1903. It's made in Massachusetts granite, and has 38 early members of the Emmets on it. Um, RELA is on the east side, and there's a harp on the south side. It's quite impressive. And if you want, I have these on my iPad. You can pull them up and you can look at them because I, I have them on here. And then um, just to finish up here, and I can take some questions if you had them, um, I really came to the conclusion that this was one of the most egalitarian um, Irish-American fraternal organizations out there. I mean, it, you had wealthy, you had you know just working class people, you had all walks of life. Um, they supported, they protected and cared for each other through their relief committees. Um, they worked with other beauty organizations, which I think was really cool at the time. The cooperation was extensive. Um, their philosophy and policy actions ran pretty much parallel to what was going on in Ireland. When Ireland started to shift from home rule to maybe armed rebellion, the Emmets were like right there. And then, um, so they followed the political and social events in Ireland, and they were pretty much basically true to their mission, which I had at the very beginning there. And um, I just wanted to thank the archives the um, University of Montana of Mansfield Library, um, the radio station, which allows me to put music on as well as um, allows me to uh, have a um, Park Without the Crown, which I can do further research on. And then also um, the Beauty Historical Society has allowed me to do some things here as well. Um, so I think I have about 10 minutes. If, if, you, if you want, I can answer some questions the best I can. And if not, then you, know, you can look at some of the documents or go through some of the books. The books are interesting because you can kind of follow the minutes as they go along. Um, there's a role that's there, and then also um, some general information. But feel free to, to page through them. Some of them, I try to get more of the readable ones for you um, so that you could um, take a peek at that. So we'll just turn the blue screen on. Okay. Yeah. You can take questions. Yeah, but did anyone have any questions or anything you want to add? Great. Yes, go ahead. When did they disband? Um, it's a good question. I'm still researching that. So my focus was, I was kind of limited by the books. Um, there is mention of them, I went up to about 1923. So there is mention of them afterwards. But it's interesting because you know the Hibernians are still there. And the Emmets, um, I don't know if it was the because of the clan of Gale went down at that time and maybe all the uh, bits that were throughout the country went down at the same time. Uh, but I would like to, that is the next, uh, one of my loose ends, one of the threads, but it's an excellent question. But if I can find it out, I'll definitely the next time. But it is on the top of my list for, for finding out because um, there were other people who came to view and they were involved in that. Speakers, I mean, not only were it the political types, but it, there was also, you know, uh, poets and actors and all, it was arts and culture. Pretty impressive, yeah. Diane. How did they send the money? Did they carry it, or did they use banks, or how? Um, some of that was bank transfer, but I'm not sure how you do all that. There were people who went back and forth. So um, one, <coughs> one particular I didn't mention was Hugo Daly. 
And he was pretty important in view because he owned uh, Gregson, Gregson, you know, you know, the hot springs, and he had a business owner, and he um, um, had a boarding house and all that. He went back to Ireland. So there might have been some of that too, but I think it was pretty formal. And what I mean by wiring is it went to more of the divi divisional headquarters. So there was kind of a pipeline to San Francisco, and then Chicago, and then New York. But the Emmett's here in Butte kind of answered to the San Francisco people. Most of those speakers would do that. They would, the ones I mentioned, would come from, start on the East Coast, maybe some go to Canada, Midwest, and then dip to Butte, San Francisco. Some of them came back two or three times to Butte. And, and, um, I did a previous uh, brown bag, and you can go back in and pull those up if you're really interested in more of a detail about that. I call them the, the cast of superstars because, I mean, if you mention any of those people when you're in Ireland, no, you know, that's their big deal. But I think that's kind of the route that it went. Yeah. Yes, Jim. Yes. But, uh, on my family's side, my sister has found my, on my mother's side, Joe Thomas in the book and his number. But uh, on my fa uh, father's side, uh, my grandfather was Mike Keene, and he came here in the traditional naming of the Irish children, you know. Well, when he went to name his oldest son, he named him Sarsfield Patrick. And then my father was the second oldest boy, and he went and named him Robert Emmett. So, oh. so, <laughs> so, I mean, so. I know, I mean, it is, it's everywhere, it really is. I think that's awesome yeah. that you brought that up, because. Well, so. well, finally, my grandmother went, and the, and the third one, she made him, which was his father's name, was Thomas, so she went and, made sure the tradition kept it. The first two he was, he, and Robert Emmett was my dad. So. Yeah, I went to high school with a fellow, his dad was Emmett Markey. <laughs> and then uh, there's several towns in the United States in the Midwest that are either Emmitsburg or Emmitsville or something like that. So it, yeah. it, it definitely, I mean, I, I have to say of all the people um, huh. that, that time period, you know, it's obvious in the naming as well. You know, thank you. Yeah. Do you want to explain how people got their numbers? <laughs> it's so complicated. It, I know. it is. It's, it's very complicated. Being facetious. If you all right, the first go on this, I try to do match them up, and people come and go, so numbers get to be reused over and over yeah. again. So trying to track that down was a little difficult, but um, there was kind of a um, say, like a hold on an old number, and I'm not quite sure how long there was a hold on that because. You may, have, you may, let's just say you were 24, and maybe you weren't paying your dues, and you were told to leave, then your number was still active, but it wasn't, so they didn't want to give your number to somebody else. So th there was a waiting period, which I'm not quite sure. And also, too, when you read minutes, um, some of it is, I mean, you do have to kind of leap a little bit to kind of come to a conclusion, and I'm not a historian, and, and so uh, to, to try to figure out, okay, how did you get that number? Did but, you not... I said, this is way more than I anticipated. The number is the page number that you were entered on. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, oh, yeah. 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 Tell people, like, like I think, I forget what my grandfather, my great-grandfather was. He was like 62. I was like, oh, well, it's because his entry was on page, page 62. 62. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's how the number... And, and then it yeah. gets confusing because some of these don't have the roster or the number on it. So no, he would just yeah. be on 62 unless he died and then somebody else might get 62. So, yeah, yeah, so they might say yeah. they might say 52, but if you go to the back of the book, that roster might not be there. Yeah, and you have somebody, to go to the first Yeah, book. so it's kind of, at first I was just going to work one book at a time, then I realized all five of them were kind of intertwined. <laughs> yeah, so, and you need that first, that yeah. roster, and, and so was, you know who who 26 and 13 and 42 are right. in uh, the minutes in book four. Yeah, so I was, I was really <laughs> yeah. thankful for a big... Um, for a big table, but I would say loose threads for me, trying to figure mm -hmm. out what, what happened, you know, the end, what was the end of it. Um, and then I might also mention too, just kind of changing strategies, because all groups do change over time. You know, the first it was kind of, okay, armed rebellion, and we should do that. Then they kind of got more into the political part of it in the 20s with letter writing and lobbying, like Senator Murray and the committees um, in the US Congress and the Senate. Um, to see if they might be able to help with Irish independence, like Woodrow Wilson, who, in my opinion, was kind of a failure for Irish independence. He was, but you also have to remember this coming out of World War I, so we were buddies with the British. The British had a huge propaganda effort here in Butte, as well as throughout the United States. Um, 
that was pro-Irish uh, Free State Treaty. So every one of those people I mentioned when they came here were the opposite of what basically the United States government policy was toward Irish independence. It was kind of interesting. It was kind of an underground type of resistance. Mm -hmm. So they were bringing people that were uh, meeting what they wanted, their, their expectation for Irish independence. Kind of, kind of an interesting thing. But um, quite a few letters um, to congressmen. There's correspondence back and forth between committees um, that are all not in here, but um, uh, all in the, uh, in the other boxes of things. But um, yeah, it was a great project, and I'm still not really done with it. I'm not quite sure. Um, I'll just say one thing here real quickly. My goal was <laughs> to go through and pull up every one of those people on the rosters, because not all of them are in there. But I wanted to find out where they came from in Ireland. Well, and as you know, there are a lot of Harringtons, <laughs> a lot of Shays, there's a lot of Patrick O'Shea, and you know, it, it's pretty hard. So, um, but I'd like to maybe take the ones off the REOA statue down at the cemetery and maybe do something like that. that and that would be workable, it'd be 38. So maybe that's something else I might do in the future. Yeah, that's just uh, Why did they get the name Literary? That's a good question because when I first looked at that, I thought, oh, this is a book club? What is this? <laughs> I love book clubs, and I'm sure some of you are in book clubs, so it's not a slam on book clubs. Um, but I think because originally they, you know, kind of when they were established, you know, um, I never saw anything, but I'm just kind of throwing out what I think was at that time, you know, there was a really big, well, Ireland, their, their heroes are their literary people, their poets, their artists. You walk up um, O'Connell Street in Dublin and there's statues of, you know, there's James Joyce and, you know, W.B. Yeats and Galway or whatever. Those people are really honored and respected, and I think in some ways more so than in this country. Um, so I think maybe the original idea was to have the arts and culture um, promoted, and that was one of their, one of their um, mission statement um, platforms there was to promote that. Um, and I think that's kind of how that came about, an association being a group. But I, I guess my main thing, too, is, um, you know, it was a male-only deal. And so they associated themselves with some of the women's organizations here in Butte, too. So I don't think they were, but also the context of the time um, was such. But I think the literary part of it was they would do the arts, bring in speakers, and that type of arrangement. So that's what I'm guessing. Oh, one other comment on the on the statue on the Thomas Francis yes. Mar statue. If you go up in the historical society, the dedication of the Capitol, there were some horses and a few people around when they dedicated the Capitol. But when this when the statue was dedicated, they literally trained people up there and had over 2,500 people at the dedication of the statue. And the thing was like, wait a minute, you beat us out for the capital right but this statue's going in front because we're still in charge yeah. and, and and i mean it's it, it's a stark contrast the two pictures yes no, that's a really good point yeah i read about the the caravan of you people that went up there and there's an old i, I meant to bring it in but i did but there's an old um uh, montana history um not, it's not the western history magazine well i guess it's kind of a precursor to that and they have a picture of you know the statue and um, the opening remarks and um, Fellow from Chicago was there, and is uh, he's a colonel. Um, just yeah, but no, that's a really good point. Yeah. And it was I thought it was interesting that the Hammonds had a lot to do with that. I didn't know that until I started reading this. I, I realized that they were involved in raising money for that statue. I always thought it was some independent group from Helena that did it. Or so yeah, it was good. Anyone else out there? And, and just one oh, sorry. Part. And Marcus Daly was heavily involved in it. Is that the statue and this group and the Irish group here. Okay. And just a trivial question is uh, the replacement of the statue is uh, somebody said uh, the horse's ass is facing Helena. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I set the room up that um, the springs would be coming in, so I added some more chairs in the back. And yeah, the Irish always bring a lot, and he's he's a good speaker. Yeah. He's always yeah, he's always really interesting. Yes, yes. Oh, you take care of my
Yes. They'd never even been on a plane before, let alone in Montana. Oh my God. 
lots of adventures. So, oh yeah, they love that. They love that. And um, one of them said, well, okay, one of them said, we asked them what their favorite was before they left. And one of them said everything. Yes. You know, because they went to Splash Montana. Yeah. They went wading in the river and yeah. they went to they couldn't you know, decide. Everything was music at Kings yeah. Park. And, so anyway, and the other one said that her favorite thing was watering at John's garden plot. Aww. Yeah. So John has like um, squash and um, yeah, tomato. That was a great thing. Because also out of the garden plot, there was raspberries. We uh, raspberries. So one time she snuck away from <laughs> snuck away from watering and <laughs> over at the raspberry bushes. Pick the raspberries. Yeah. So from the time the kids were little, yeah. I think the first time were the birds touch your gardens. Oh, yeah. And they used to, you know, if it was that time yeah. of year, okay. it's a so few years since. Yeah, they yeah. 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 the raspberry patch. Yeah. 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 And there's just yeah. something yeah. magical about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the best, yeah. for sure. Yeah. We had, we had a cat who's now deceased, but she used to um, get up on her hind legs and try to pick with me. She tried to close her paws around a very... She saw me do it, and she brought it with me all the time. Oh, funny. Oh, it's so cute. Can cats have raspberries? <laughs> Did she catch the raspberry? Me. Oh, okay. Um, she, bat, she bat them. She bat I didn't know she was she going to eat them. Um, for her to, for her to um, stand on her high knees and even try to do it. Yeah. That, you know, without opposable thumb. That is so funny. It was so cute because yeah. it's your try. Yeah. 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 So they had, they had a good time. Oh, and we took them up to bison race. I've not been up there yet. That's on yeah, my, oh, my I know. It's, it's on my list. It's a great place. I think um, the next time somebody comes out to visit me, I'm going to say, well, this is what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> we're not going to go tip over the bison in, in Yellowstone with all the other idiots. We're going to go watch them up here. Yeah, it was really, it was really quiet up there. I mean, yeah. there's a few people, but um, yeah, we saw quite a few bison, and they got to see a pronghorn antelope, which nice. they don't see where they live. Yeah, and we're like, oh, there's uh, to go down to Dillon, you're going to see the antelope. There's, um, there's a pond there that you can walk around, uh -huh. and but it was so it was so scummy with that. But still, you could see 